So far we've looked at calorimetry, Hess's law. Today I want to look at the use of bond enthalpies as a way of calculating the heat of a reaction. First of all, we need to understand a bit about the processes of forming and breaking bonds. During most chemical reactions, we have two substances. Let's say A and B, or diatomic molecules. The first thing we need to do in order for the reaction to occur is to break the bonds that exist between them. When we do that, we force some reaction intermediaries, and then they combine together to make products. So we have both breaking and the forming of bonds. The action of breaking bonds requires the input of energy. To break the electrostatic forces, we have to pull the molecules apart. That's an endothermic step. Then we form bonds where the electromagnetic forces draw our two atoms or molecules together and form bonds. The difference between these two determines whether or not we have an endo or exothermic reaction. In the example I've shown here, because products are higher up than my reactants, I have an example of an endothermic reaction. Bond enthalpies. First of all, what is it? Well, it's the energy required to break one mole of bonds in a gaseous molecule at our standard thermodynamic conditions, 25 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals. And we're allowed to break only one bond. So if I take, for instance, the molecule methane, which has four carbon hydrogen bonds, I'm just going to break one of them. And that requires 418 joules of energy to pull that hydrogen off from the methane molecule. Average bond enthalpy is the energy to break one mole of bonds over a range of related compounds. So if I want to know the strength of the carbon hydrogen bond, I might look at the example that I have here for methane, but I might also consider the molecule ethane, and it might have a slightly different bond energy, and here, propane. What we often consider is the average of these numbers for the carbon-hydrogen bond. And this is what's presented in your IB data booklet. The IB data booklet has examples of both bond enthalpy, which would be in the case of something like bromine bonded to bromine, or chlorine bonded to chlorine. But it also has average bond enthalpies, as shown here, 414 kilojoules for the carbon-hydrogen bond. Be careful when you use this particular table because it has both single bonds and multiple bonds. Let's look at a sample problem in terms of how this might work. I want to take the fuel methanol and burn that fuel to make carbon dioxide and water. Here, let's map out our strategy. I'm going to start off with my reactants, the methanol and the oxygen. Then I'm going to break bonds, tearing these molecules apart to form individual atoms all at the gas state. These I'm going to call my reaction intermediates. Then I'm going to take these and combine them together to form my carbon dioxide and water molecule. And the difference between these two I can then use to determine the enthalpy of my reaction. In order to do this, I need to have an idea of what the molecules look like. So here I'm giving a sketch, just showing the bonds. I'm not too interested in the unbonded pairs. Now, Let's take a look at the bonds we have to break and the bonds we form. The bonds we break deal with our reactants, methanol and oxygen. Now, it's important to note here that I'm not just breaking one methanol. According to the balanced chemical equation, I'm breaking two methanols and three oxygen molecules. So when I'm counting up bonds, I must take into account how many there are of each species. So I have six carbon hydrogen bonds. I'll have two carbon oxygen bonds, two oxygen hydrogen bonds, and three double bonded oxygen bonds. And I looked these up on table 12 in the IB data booklet. Summing it up, I require 5,159 kilojoules of energy to break all those bonds. Now the bonds I form. Again, I want to take into account how many molecules I make of each substance. Now the first substance, which carbon dioxide, it has two carbon oxygen bonds in it. And in fact, because I'm making two of them, I'll have four carbon double bonded oxygen bonds. Similarly with water, each water molecule has two OH bonds, so altogether I'll have eight OH bonds. And there's the total that I'm going to generate from the forming of those bonds, 6,920 joules. Let's go back to our energy diagram. So I have to put in 5,159 kilojoules of energy to form the individual atoms, and then I'm going to get out of that, in the forming of bonds, the release of 6,920 kilojoules. So to make my diagram a little bit more to scale, that dropping down arrow is actually going to be a bit larger than what's shown here. 
And the enthalpy change in my reaction is actually going to be an exothermic reaction, finishing up with products more stable than my reactants. To determine that value, I just simply do the addition that's shown here. So it's negative 1,761 kilojoules. Now that's the amount of energy that's generated from two moles of methanol. If I want to know the heat for burning one mole of methanol, I need to divide that by two. So negative 880 kilojoules per mole of methanol. Let's take a look at how that actually compares with measured values that are in your IB data booklet. So there's my experimental value, but reported in the literature is the following value. Why the difference? Well, first off, we can take into account that we used average bond enthalpies, and the actual strength of the bonds may differ slightly in the substances we're using. So that could lead to some values that change. But perhaps the biggest problem that lies in this is the fact that bond enthalpies is based on gaseous molecules. And if you look at the reaction we studied, methanol is a liquid and the water that we produced is a liquid. That's going to cause some changes in our values. Let's look at how those values might be changed. So here I have a copy of our enthalpy diagram. If I begin with methanol liquid, methanol liquid actually has less energy or less enthalpy than methanol gas. So I actually would be beginning at a lower point. And I finish with H2O liquid, and that too would be a slightly lower point than the H2O gas that I have calculated. The enthalpy change then would actually be that distance that's shown there by the white dashed line. So that's perhaps another reason why my answers differ. So we've covered all of our methods of determining the enthalpy change of a reaction. In the last program, we'll look at the use of at, uh, how energy impacts ozone in our atmosphere. Any questions, please post them. And thanks for watching.